the Shiki Science Show clips. So given some of the studies we just brought up then, how would you go about describing what aging is and the role of N80 plus? <laughs> <laughs> what is aging? Okay, so um so I think aging is a um developmental uh I think aging is intrinsically linked to development. Um and I can defend that in multiple ways. First, the strongest, um, you know, long-lived mutants that have been identified in animal systems as diverse as worms and rodents are loss of function alleles of genes involved in growth. Right, so you know, DAF two and insulin IGF um, pathway, and then the pituitary mutants in in mice, including the Snell dwarf mice and the Ames dwarf mice and the pit mice. All of these um, genes that encode growth factor and growth hormone receptor and growth hormone releasing factor and so forth and so on, you knock out both copies and you get very small shrimpy mice that are infertile and very long lived and very cancer resistant. And so you, you mutate growth, you um, alter uh, the course of aging. Um, I have a difficult the calling those longevity genes because the genes were actually conserved for growth and fertility. And in fact, in uh, the development of, of animals, which is what, 750, 800 million years of evolution, um, animals evolved to um, be successfully born and to develop the ability to form motility and acquiring our own food and then recognizing mates and avoiding predation and reproducing and either having lots of babies or protecting the smaller number of babies until they're, they can successfully reproduce. And some animals can only reproduce one time, in which case there's really no selection for longevity. And some uh, animals can reproduce multiple times in which there's a slight selection for longevity because let's say a fox that can uh, live six years um, might have six times as many, you know, broods, pups or whatever foxes have than one that, that, that can only reproduce one time, but is that really longevity or is it fox cleverness that allowed it and fox sex appeal and all the other things that allowed that fox to to reproduce, um, you know, over six years and, you know, surviving six winters. It's, you know, hunting ability. It's a lot of things. So I see longevity, the genetic components of longevity as basically being emergent properties of selected traits. I don't really see lifespan as a directed, directly selected traits. Um, there are no dominant longevity genes that have been identified um, in animals to my knowledge. I have a review article that's coming out on Friday, September, 23rd, I'm not quite sure when this YouTube video will come out, but today is September 21. So in two days from today, I have a review article coming out with over 125 citations, the title of which is Sirtuins are not conserved longevity genes. I fully debunk the idea that Sirtuins are dominantly acting conserved longevity genes from yeast to, to humans. It's just not true. Um, the narrative that sirtuins are the primary mediators 
of NAD supplementation is not evidence-based. Um, connection between NAD and aging is that NAD is the linchpin of metabolism and that our repair capacity and resiliency declines in aging. And many of those repair and resiliency reactions depend upon NAD and, and all of the accumulated insults um, involve, you know, losses to, to the NAD system. So I think there is a use case for nicotinamide riboside in human health. It may be, in fact, more important as we age. There's lots of clinical trials involving NR to test these hypotheses. Um, I'm evidence-based, so, you know, you don't see a, you know, a, a supplement bottle, you know, behind me as I speak. And, and you don't, you know, you don't see me getting out ahead of my skis and saying, you know, making um, fanciful claims about uh, extending human lifespan. But I'm excited about the clinical trials that are being done with NR because what it does, you know, in rodent systems is so powerful. And although we tend to like very striking quantitative phenotypes like protection from heart failure. So we tend to do shorter term experiments and then sacrifice the animals and then look at mechanisms as opposed to doing two and three year long experiments and looking at, you know, life and death things. But other people are doing those things as well. So I'm excited for the field, but I think that one of the problems is that it's deeply contaminated with uh, some statements that are just not evidence-based at all. Like the idea that sirtuins are longevity genes is just not evidence-based at all. And, I, and, I, and, and, and so I think it's, it's very problematic. And I spend a lot of time trying to you know, educate people on that.